Welcome to Convince Me in 15 Minutes, where our guests will have 15 minutes to present their case, followed by questions from Luke Tawis and Keith Thompson. I'm Dennis Mosley-Williams. I'm the founder of DMW Strategic Consulting and the author of the book, Serious Shift, How Staging Experiences Can Save Your Practice. I'm delighted to be a guest on this podcast Convince me in 15 minutes. I'm going to convince you in the next 15 minutes that selling excellent investments and delivering appropriate, appropriate, exceptional, and timely advice isn't enough to satisfy your clients. I can do this in three slides. I can prove this to you in five minutes with one slide, but I'll take some time to tell you funny stories. Here we go. What I want to talk to you about is the progression of economic value. There is a fundamental shift in the very fabric of the economy. What's happening is, as we know, the economy is always changing. And consumer sensibility, what our clients want, drives this change. Business has to constantly shift to meet these new demands to create value for clients and profits for your business. So let's begin at the very, very beginning with some basic, basic stuff here, which is we pay a premium. You'll see premium uh, pricing on the bottom. We pay a premium for things on the right-hand side. The more relevant the need, the, the good or service is to our needs, the more relevant it is, and the more differentiated it is. If something's highly differentiated, unique, stands out from everything else, has some value built in uh, that nobody else has, that matters to us. If what is on offer matters the most to us, we will pay a premium price. This is just the way all business works. Let's start at the very, very beginning. The agrarian economy, the predominant economic offering were commodities. As you know, commodities are raw materials that we pull out of the ground and we don't do anything to them. When people buy commodities, they have one um, driving concern, price, what they cost. Commodities are raw things. They're not products or goods. They're raw materials, completely undifferentiated from each other. A pile of coal dug out of the ground in British Columbia is no different than a pile of coal dug out of the ground in Russia. Coal is coal. However, and by the way, commodities ruled the agrarian economy. The agrarian economy was the dominant economy for thousands of years. If you take a bunch of commodities and you customize them, they become goods. You turn the trees into two by fours. You turn the coffee beans, the raw coffee beans, into roasted ground coffee beans that people can use at home. What happened to the agrarian economy? It's still there. It gets subsumed up into the next economy. There's just simply fewer farmers than there were previously. Now we're in the industrial economy where goods are the predominant economic offering. Hold on. If you take a bunch of goods and you customize them into services, actions that you take on someone's behalf, customized goods, we get to the service economy. Let's pause here for a moment. I'm going to argue that the commodity of the financial services industry is not money currency investments. It's not money, it's information. Specifically, the commodity of financial planning is data. We got our little character standing on a soapbox just talking. TikTok, for goodness sakes. Googling, what's the easiest, fastest, most sensible way to save a million dollars? But if I customize that data and I turn it into information, such as a well-written, thought-out book on investing. There's many to cite here as examples. 
it goes from being free or as cheap as chips commodity to somebody paying like $45 for that book. Data is worth nothing. Information, I beg your pardon. Information is worth, let's say, $45 for a great book. Actions taken on somebody else's behalf, the services, where the goods are subsumed up into the services, that's worth 1% of your to total portfolio. Now, this is where we get sticky, everybody. What you no longer work in the service economy, but you don't know that. You talk about experiences as though they're services. You use those terms synonymously. And I want to show you that experiences are as different from services as services are from goods. And in fact, a business that delivers services uh, fundamentally deploys their resources differently than a business that stages experiences. Meaning, even though Dunkin' Donuts, if I may cite them, which I am a fan, by the way, and Starbucks, which I'm also a fan, are both selling coffee, those two businesses are completely different businesses. And one of those businesses, Dunkin' Donuts, could not become Starbucks by simply changing the decor. It would require a fundamental, serious shift in terms of thinking and understanding what business they are actually in. So the lesson here, the most important thing to take out of this, is that in the service economy, all goods and services became commoditized. They compete on price. Whether the marketplace believes that all mutual funds, annuities, life insurance products, and financial services in general are fungible, not differentiated at all, uh, commoditized in that they compete on price, and the belief is that they can be easily exchanged for the identical, and that extends into you. Advisors are also commoditized and they can be easily replaced, which I know isn't true, and you know that isn't true, but what the marketplace believes is what matters, and that's what we're here to talk about. The other big difference here is this, so just stick with me. What if we take a whole bunch of services, financial planning services, and we customize them for one person, one couple, one client at a time, a completely customized experience designed like a glove for this one client to engage and delight them in an inherently personal way. Stick with me, everybody. A big difference between service and experience is that service is intended to save people time and money. Experience is not. Think about a Zoom meeting and coming out of the pandemic, this has not been good for us. Hey, let's uh, do this meeting via Zoom. On one hand, gentlemen, it's been wonderful. It's brought us together. Isn't that magic? On the other, it allows us to say to our clients, hey, let me save you some time. I'll save you time, service. Don't drive downtown to see me. Let's strip all of the human connection out of this meeting and I'll just give you the details on your, on your portfolio. Just the dirty details, boom, straight, like a drive through window. Experience is about creating time well spent. Experience is time well designed. It's, Time with a financial advisor should be deeply personal, meaningful, um, memorable. The hallmark of an experience is you remember it. Oh, do you remember when we were there just checking into the lobby, how we felt? That's an experience. It's memorable, deeply personal, and if not, transformational. So what if you take a whole bunch of experiences? onboarding, 
review meetings, check-in calls, client dinners or events or meetings or time with clients. The, if you looked at your entire service matrix, service is a separate thing. So Dennis, this is everything I did in a year. And if I helped you turn every one of those little things into an experience, and all of these experiences are informed by the same guiding principle or idea. So for everybody listening, let's assume that these three words mean everything to you and the work you do with your clients. Healthy, wealthy, wise. Clearly we're working on the wealthy stuff. That's what is fun. That's what our job's about. But what about, you know, you're also into making people think differently, smarter, more positively, and also live in a happy life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you take all of these experiences and they're all laid out sequentially. So you take the experiences and you customize them and this is what they become. They become transformations. Note in the graphic that the little guru, the little advisor person is now sitting behind the client. The client has ascended. Think Maslow's hierarchy of needs here. These people come in to see you. They know, they expect, let's just stick on services. Look at that graph. They expect fantastic services. They expect 24 access, 24 hour access to information. They expect you to get back to them right away. And they expect all this sophisticated, complicated financial planning. And they don't expect to pay a lot for it. Being really good at your job is table stakes. What you want is to think of it this way. Services, that's what you do. Experiences, that's how you do it. And when in any transaction, even just buying a cup of coffee, to saying this is my multi-million dollar portfolio. If the person, the client, during the transaction feels seen as an individual, the transaction will matter more to them. So there's one more thing I'm going to point out on this whole thing, and then I'm going to consider this argument one. <laughs> I've had a lot of fun, <laughs> which is this. There's something really interesting here. If you look back at this progression of economic value, you make more you create more value and more economic activity, more revenue and profit, the further you go, you move away from what it is fundamentally all about. So for those of you who missed this at the beginning, I don't think the commodity, the financial service industry is money. I think it's information and helping people make the right decisions. And I think the further, now granted, it all starts with money information. Fair enough. What I'm saying, therefore, is the further you get away from that nonsense, <laughs> the more value you create. Up in transformations is helping people have better, conver I'm picking one purposely left field here, have it, helping your clients have better communication slash relationships with their children by buying them the book, How to Talk So Kids Will Listen, How to Listen So Kids Will Talk. That will matter more to your client than another prospectus. I'm gonna put this up really quickly for you all. If you point your camera at it and you fill this out, I'll not only send you my blog, I'm gonna send you an ebook, my book, Serious Shift. It's a gift from the gentleman. Thank you for having me on. And for those of you who are more old fashioned, here's all my places you can find me in the uh, blogger's verse or whatever it is out there on the internet. I'll leave this up for a moment, then I'm gonna stop sharing. This was a ton of fun. I look forward to whatever questions you guys might have. Uh, Dennis, that was fantastic. Uh, is there any way you can share something specifically what a, a financial advisor has done to uh, really create these transformations for client experiences? Well, sure. So I've been working with financial advisors since the mid 1990s. So I'm going to reference my buddy, Paul Fenner in Michigan, an advisor that we've worked with that I really, really admire. He's built his entire business around this truth. And this truth is called shoot the, I shouldn't, it's, it's shoot the puck is his secret. It's his observation that the clients he works with 
who are very, very busy professional couples who have families. Family is really important to them. He has staged the entire experience in his home. He brings people to his home. He meets them there. He has a set up uh, staged seating area, all designed to have a very specific conversation around the idea of values, what's important to you, and digging in really, really deeply. He teaches his clients about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He helps them see what their own investor behavior is, how money triggers them, etc. And he's guided by this one big, beautiful idea, which is influencing his clients one positive conversation at a time. Shoot the puck is get your affairs in order. Don't miss any of your opportunities. His I'm going to tell you one of the things that he does, this is where shoot the puck comes from. He sits you in this very specific area. He always sits his clients across from him. Over his shoulder, he has a poster of a hockey player. It's a famous picture of Steve Eiserman taking a slap shot in the playoffs that would move the Red Wings, an original six team at long last after this huge drought into the Stanley Cup final. It's a big deal, it's particularly for hockey fans and people in Michigan. Of course, people always ask, are you a hockey fan? He looks at, he says, no. And he explains what this picture is all about. It's his bridge to get into their heads a little bit about what are you not shooting the puck on? What are the plans you keep talking about, but the plan, your discussions you're having, plans aren't getting made. He works with them aspirationally. So he builds financial plans, but then also aspirational plans out from the future, working them back today so they can see the steps between now and self-actualization. So please just afford me 30 more seconds. That's what's behind him. When he talks to them about his purpose, his theme, and how he sees the life, the, uh, life he then says, let me show you something else. And behind them on the wall, he has a poster of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which some of us are very familiar with it. Some of us know what it is, but we're not so familiar. The very bottom level of our needs is air and water and food. <laughs> the next level is, you know, shelter, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's love and belonging, self-esteem, self-actualization as it gets higher. He points out that most of the people he meets, where their struggle is, what they're working on, isn't the first two. It begins at love and belonging. It's families, friendships, your relationship with yourself self-esteem, your career and where you want to go, and ultimately self-actualization, who you really are and how you're going to get there. And then he points out this amazing truth. Financial planning and all financial services, for as important as it is, it only covers the first two rungs. That's it. All the people I come to work with me, what they're working on isn't even this stuff. It's this other stuff, and nobody helps them. He's got books, movies, he, books and book clubs, movies and movie clubs for discussion around these cool ideas that he shares willingly because he believes strongly that his job is to guide clients to transformations. Dennis, you, you kind of continue to bring up the, the Starbucks versus the Dunkin' Donuts kind of analogy. But yeah. aren't some people just Dunkin' Donuts people and some people are Starbucks people? 100%. You know, when, you're, when you're trying to deliver these experiences, I, I will suggest that there are some people that you deliver that experience and they'll say, hey, this is disingenuous. Uh, it's not really fundamental to what it is that I came here to do. And okay. I really just want a cup of coffee. Okay, that's interesting. So first, yes, and I agree with you. And I said that's the scariest part about making this shift. Right now, you're making a killing selling people coffee, just giving them coffee, giving them coffee. Now I'm saying, if you're interested, you could pivot and open Starbucks, but realize you're going to lose a lot of your audience that don't want this. So as you move up the progression of economic value, in this case, to staging experiences, you're correct. Experiences are for some people. And I just shared this the other day, by the way, which was I said, um, is the customer always right? And here's the answer. Only in the service economy. 
This Big Mac sucks. Oh, okay, sir, we must have done something wrong. Here's another one made exactly like we make the other billion a day on the planet. Our bad. Here, have another one. We apologize. In the experience economy, if a client says to you, to the manager, the manager at the Starbucks says, hey, what do you think? And the guy says, you know, I'm not trying to be rude, but honestly, this sucks. I hate it. Okay, here's the question. Is he right or is he in the wrong place? He's in the wrong place. And the worst thing the manager could say, could do, is try to make that guy happy. So get him out of there before he poisons everybody else. Do work for people who matter. Now, you said something else that was really cool. You used the term disingenuous. Ah, thank you for bringing that up. This is for everybody out there who worries about it and doesn't know the difference between fake and phony. They're different. Let me explain. At the heart of staging and experience is two things. Authenticity. Was I pound the microphone? I'm sure you all appreciated that. Authenticity. <laughs> I believe in this thing I'm trying to get you to buy into. That's part one. Part two is generosity. I'm going to share it with you <laughs> in a way that no reasonable person would think is reasonable. It's my whole business is about healthy, wealthy, wise. Okay? That's, I'm tr it's really honestly what I believe. And I'm going to share it with you. That's authentic. Disney World, just stick with me, is fake. It's not really a magic kingdom. <laughs> it's a movie set. The whole thing is a staged environment designed, including having smaller doors, etc., designed to make us feel something. Experiences are about emotions. But it's not phony. They believe what they're trying to do, which is create a beautiful place, a, a safe place, a fun space, where adults and children can have fun together. That's their, that's their purpose. That's what they're about. Starbucks. It's not really an Italian coffee shop. You're not really in Venice. You're in, a, you're in Cleveland, downtown, and it's February and the wind is blowing. They're not fake, or it's a fake environment, but their desire to be the third place is sincere and real. Phony is when I tell the guy at the other coffee shop what Starbucks is doing, he misses the lesson completely and says, yeah, I can see why that would work. I can see why if I do that, I could jam somebody five bucks for a cup of coffee. So I'm going to do it. And you're going to fail because you don't believe in it. Human beings are finely tuned with their antenna <laughs> to discern the fake from the phony. One of the frameworks we use in experience design uh, has two aspects to it that we're think I'm thinking of right now. One of them is surprise. And the other is suspense. So well done. Efficiency is the enemy of experience. Do you know why your dental appointment always goes the exact same way, no matter where you live in the civilized world? Because nobody, save some freaks and weirdos, wants to go to the dentist to get pleasure out of it. We want it the same, predictable, so we can tell ourselves, this takes about four more minutes, and then this happens, and I'm the hell out of here. Don't be a dental appointment. Why are you trying to make your meetings efficient? No, no, no. Time well designed. They should be satisfying. There should be very little sacrifice. There should be some surprise in there. There should be some suspense. Remember last time they did this and the time before it was this? They're always doing that interesting little signature thing. I want to see what that's about. And then, of course, there should be an element of sharing a secret that secret is what your business is all about. It's what the client tells the next client. No, no, no. It's not the financial planning. It's this. If it wasn't for Dennis, I wouldn't even know about this. That's what I bought into. You want to buy into that too. The price is give them all your money. Attend your meetings and do what you're told. And you'll get all the good stuff. Well, it's interesting you bring up a dentist. I just went to one last week. And when I leaned back in the chair... I looked up at the fluorescent light and um, there was a saying up there that said, only floss the teeth you want to keep. And yeah. uh, I took a picture of it and texted it to my kids and because uh, it made me chuckle. So, yeah. Um, but, you know, 
in you know speaking of taking pictures and texting uh keith and i have worked together for i think 17 years now keith and um i think i've only taken one picture and texted that to him when i was in a financial advisor's office and okay. um i walk in a uh, beautiful office and um i get right into the the uh the conference room and the tv's on it has my name on it the company name um you know, wonderfully staged room with, uh, you know, drinks already there, uh, yep. you know, all the seats were rearranged perfectly. He was expecting me. He welcomed me. And it was, you know, just something that I wasn't expecting. And, you know, I mean, can it be something as simple as that? Of course it can. Of course. And, you know, yes, it can be. All you're demonstrating is, again, experience is time well designed. And what you're doing is you're sending a an impression or a signal, a clue as to what you're all about. So for instance, if one of the impressions you wanted to make to anyone who came into that office, I'm going to start with a real simple one is we care. We care. Like we're legitimately emotionally invested and present in this meeting with you. A harmonizing cue, a way that you would make that, impression known to your client would be well the room had flatware glassware and a tablecloth everything was set up nobody went to get a single thing when we were there they were ready for me they all met me in the office they all were waiting I go in and check in with the receptions think about how damaging this is it happens all the time Somebody shows up for a financial planning meeting. This happens every day and nobody even cringes. Person opens the door. They say, good morning. I'm going to have to leave in a moment, gentlemen. Oh, good morning. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. I have a meeting with Keith. And they say, okay, great. And who are you? I say, I'm Dennis Mosley Williams. And then they say, does Keith know you're coming? And I, or is he expecting you? And I say, yeah. They say, okay, I'll let him know and I'll get you a coffee. That happens every day. It makes my eye twitch. It should be, I show up for a meeting, I open the door, and there's a team waiting for me. My name's on that sign. They're ready. They tell me who they are. When I'm sitting, there's some consideration for my time. Not necessarily, let's hurry it up. That should be a Zoom. You're a discount chop shop. No, no, there should be a moment where I sit somewhere and gather my thoughts, and all time changes. I say, wow, I could be with these people all day. And the meeting hasn't even started. I'm just in your lobby. Well, Dennis, obviously we could sit here with you all day too. We can't tell you how much we appreciate you taking the time to visit with us. Uh, I can't thank you enough, Dennis. We're right here on the hour mark. So thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. I got to rock and roll. Take care of yourselves. Thanks everybody for listening. Thank you.